Hello students, welcome to this session. Uh, we'll be looking at x-rays, which is a topic in book four. And this is not the first time we've come across x-rays. We came across x-rays in the topic, the electromagnetic spectrum, where we found that x-rays are part of the EM spectrum. We just looked at how they are produced uh, briefly and also some of the uses. But in this topic, we'll go deep and see exactly how are these X-rays produced. Also in the chapter seven, when we are looking at the cathode rays, uh, we were able to note that when we stop cathode rays, then the kinetic energy they possess is converted to X-rays and also heat energy. Uh, X-rays, like you can see, they are simply called X-rays. So why this term X-rays? X-rays were first discovered in 1895 by a German physicist by the name Konrad Rettigen. You will forgive me uh, for the pronunciation that is Conrad Rettigen in 1895 when he was doing experiments on cathode rays and because by this time the nature of x-rays uh, was not known then uh, they were named x-rays I know most mathematicians have been blamed for identifying anything that is unknown with x and here we also find a physicist uh, when we didn't know the nature of these X-rays, then we call them X-rays. So in this topic, by the time we'll be through with the topic, uh, you should be able to state the properties of X-rays. You should also be able to explain how X-rays are produced. You should also be in a position to state the uses of X-rays as well as note the some of the dangers of x-rays that we have and finally we will be in a position to look at or be able to solve a numerical problems involving x-rays so we'll go straight to the production of x-rays and like we noted in the em spectrum that x-rays are produced in an x-ray tube so next we'll be looking at the x-ray tube so we'll go straight to the production of x-rays and x-rays are produced in an x-ray tube and the simple concept under which x-rays are produced is that we get to stop the cathode rays the cathode rays possess the kinetic energy so we have a cathode rays and these cathode rays they have the kinetic energy then when we suddenly stop the, uh, the cathode rays this kinetic energy is converted into two types of energies one being heat energy which takes most of the energy that is converted then the other is the x-rays so when we suddenly stop this cathode rays and we stop it with a metal target then we convert it to heat energy which takes about 99.5 percent of the kinetic energy and then the x-rays uh, takes 0.5 percent so this is the x-ray tube where x-rays are produced and by the time we are through with this you should be able to identify the various parts of an x-ray tube and also their functions and how are they made again to fit to those functions so we have a glass tube here we have a glass envelope and this glass envelope is evacuated that is it's a vacuum inside then on top of the glass envelope we have a lead shield we have lead lead is a metal of very high density 
we'll be looking at in its importance here. Then you also have a cathode. And in this case, it's a special type of a cathode. We call it a focusing cathode. Then we have a filament, definitely, will be used to heat the cathode. Then on the other side, we have a target. It's tungsten target. And this tungsten target is embedded on the anode. And the, our anode is connected to the transformer and so is our filament. It is also connected to the transformer which is helping us to have the voltage input to our uh, X-ray. We'll be looking at all the parts now and seeing what is their importance. So here we have the cathode. If you look at the cathode, it is connected to a transformer here. I want you to be very keen and note the terminals of this particular filament that is being supplied by current here. This is our heating circuit. It is going to heat the filament and now the filament will in turn heat the cathode. If you look at the terminals, they are connected to this part of the transformer. If you look at this number of turns, they are less than the number of turns up here. Meaning that this now, the circuit supplying the current to the filament is a step down transformer for the, this circuit, which is supplying the heater circuit. Then our filament, therefore, we are supplying a very low voltage to the heating circuit, a voltage of about 10 volts. And this voltage can be varied, 10 and below thereabout. So it's a very low voltage of about 10 volts on the heating circuit. It heats the cathode, and this cathode will pro uh, produce electrons through thermionic emission. And therefore, again, just like in the CRO, we need a metal here which is of low work function. Then when you look at this cathode, it is shaped in a concave. It has a concave shape. And that is why we are calling it the focusing cathode. Remember, if this was a reflector and we had light falling on this concave, then it is going to converge that particular light. The same thing happens. After the electrons are produced through thermionic emission, they are focused. The shape of the cathode helps to focus them onto the metal target. That's why we have it concave in shape so that it can help in focusing the cathodes onto the metal target. So after the cathodes are produced, they are accelerated towards the target by the anode. Again, the anode is still being supplied by the voltage from our transformer. Look, in this case now, we are using the extreme ends. So the number of turns here are more than the input, the primary coils. Then in this case, now what you are supplying to the anode, we are supplying a stepped up voltage. This is now a step up transformer supplying to the anode. It, uh, this voltage can be varied and we need to have a very high voltage at the anode. This voltage can be varied from about 10 kilovolts, that is 10,000 volts, all the way to 150 kilovolts, that is 150,000 volts. Therefore, it is at a very high voltage uh, when we are comparing it to the uh, cathode. In this case, now, these cathodes, after they hit the metal target, then we find that 99.5% of the kinetic energy being carried by the cathodes is being converted to heat energy. Therefore, this metal here, which acts as our target, must be a metal that can withstand very high temperatures. And if it can't withstand very high temperatures, then it's going to melt. 
the temperatures here can go as high as 2500 degrees Celsius. Therefore, the target uses a metal with a very high melting point. And one of the metal that is used to make uh, the target is tungsten. Tungsten has a very high melting point. So we are saying that the target can be made with tungsten, a metal of a melting point of 3,422 degrees Celsius. We can also use molybdenum, molybdenum, it's another metal that can be used. It has a slightly lower melting point compared to that of tungsten of 2,623 degrees Celsius. Therefore, you can see these are metals of very high melting point. Therefore, they can't melt easily and that there are a lot of heat that is being generated after the cathodes hit the target. Mostly, tungsten is used. That's why you see this is a tungsten target and because of its relatively high melting point. This note that the melting point is at standard temperature and pressure. Remember this can change, it can reduce or increase depending on the atmospheric pressure and also the surrounding uh, uh, temperature. Then you can see due to the a lot of heat that is generated after the cathodes hit the target, then this metal, after this metal having a very high melting point, then still the heat will be generated. Therefore, that's why we make the anode or we embed the target onto a copper anode. This is a copper anode. Why do we need the anode to be made of copper? We are talking this are matters heat. And copper is a very good heat conductor. And therefore, this heat, after it is being generated, so we are talking now of the copper anode. And we are saying the reason why we need to use copper is because copper is a good heat conductor. So therefore, you are looking at ways now. How are we going to, to do away with this heat that has been generated at the anode? So the first thing, we make the anode to be of copper, a very good conductor. Then again, on this anode, we have oil that is being supplied. The copper has conducted away the heat from the metal target. So how do we take away that heat so that it continues to, to, to absorb more heat from the target? Then we supply oil through the, this tube here. So the oil will get in, collect the heat from the anode, move out and dissipate it out uh, to the environment. And to enhance that giving away of heat, then we have the copper fins. They are blackened. Remember, black is a very good heat absorber. So these are blackened copper fins again. We make them to be thin enough so that we increase the surface area for heat absorption and also for heat dissipation. Uh, so this is, these three ways help in cooling the anode. That is the copper, a good conductor, the oil takes, collects the heat from the anode, goes out and dissipates it out to the surrounding. And also we have the copper fins which help in increasing the surface area for that heat to be given out. Thank you.